Strata staat. En uh, you will speak on the spaces of self adjoint platform operators and the spectrum. Yes, thanks a lot um, uh, for this nice introduction and in particular for inviting me to Amsterdam. So I was used to spend my holidays in Holland when I was a child, but 20 years ago when I started to do mathematics, I stopped to go to the Netherlands for reasons which are not related to each other, I think. And uh, But it feels really good to be back now. And uh, yeah, now I've learned that we go for drinks after the talk, so it will be a quick talk. <laughs> okay, so let me make um, first and uh, an artwork on a um, rather soon appearing book by Nora Doll, Hermann Schulz Baldes, and myself. And the book has essentially the title Spectral Flow. <laughs> it has more than 400 pages. It will appear in the Brüte. Um, it will be open access so you can download it from the website of the Greuther from July, and you will find everything I'm talking today and much more in this book. So you might look out for it once it has appeared. Okay, so I start with a first check section on preliminary. So some basics of functional analysis, which probably are all well known to you. <laughs> so I will only consider complex of spaces in the stock. Many of the things I'm talking about will be true in real number of spaces as well. <clears throat> and I always want to have my help of spaces to be separable. Complex, separable, help of space. And uh, scalar product. Will always be denoted with these kind of brackets. So then, what else do I need? I will need the space L of H. This will be um, the Banner space. Of all bounded operators, the bounded linear operators. On H, and I will use the downward norm on this space, so it will be minimum over all U, norm U, less than or equal to one T U. So then another set that will appear is GL of H. This will be the set of all bounded operators such that C is bijective. And okay, if it's bijective, then it has an inverse, and the inverse should also be bounded. And you probably know that this is the same than just requiring the bijectivity of this operator. So by the open mapping principle of Banach and Schalke. And this is an open subset. In L of H. Okay. And then another concept which falls under this preliminaries is so whenever I have an operator T, which is bounded, then I also have a so-called adjoint of that operator. So there is an operator T star in L of H, um, which is determined by doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. I'll follow you. Which is determined by T U V U C T star V or U V in H. <clears throat> and which satisfies well, if I do this process twice, 
and I get the original operator T. Oh, yeah, that's all there was. Actually, we did this non preserving and circle is a kernel of P star is the orthogonal complement of the image of T. P star and all these properties follow from this determining and equality scalar forward. Okay. Um, and then two further spaces of operators will be S of H. This is maybe not that standard notation, but S is just canonical for sulfur joint. This will be the space the set of all T and L of H such that T star is T. This is um, a closed subset of L of H. But it's not a subspace because if you multiply by a non real number, then the result will no longer be solved, right? And finally, I will maybe at some point the unitary operators, which are all T that are invertible and which have the property that the adjoint is the inverse. Okay. That is everything about preliminaries. So we now go straight into Breton operator. We tried it as space of sulfur joint, space of sulfur joint, Breton operator, and expected flow. So we now know what a sulfur joint operator is, but um, we still need to know what a we need to know what a Breton operator is. This is something that I did not put into preliminaries. So this will be uh, two. And um, I will start straight with the definition. So an operator T in L of H. So this is the first condition. So we need the operator to be bounded. Is called Breton if so we have two equivalent conditions. <laughs> so we can say that the dimension of the kernel of P is finite, and the co dimension of the image of T is finite in the sense of. Linear algebra, so we know that every subspace of the vector space has a complementary space, and so this one should just be of finite dimension. <clears throat> and this is equivalent to dimension kernel of T is finite, dimension kernel of the adjoint is finite. This comes from this equality, but there's, um, yeah, a certain pitfall here. We also have to require that the operator has a closed branch. There are books that also put this condition here in this definition, but it's redundant. You can show that if this holds, then the image is automatically closed. But in this situation, it's not necessary in case you really have to require it. Okay. Um, and then I also give a name to a set of operators. operator. I will denote them by F of H. It will be all P and L of H such that. P is Bretholm, and I always consider this as a subset of the bounded linear operators. So it gets automatically um, the metric by just, by just restricting the norm. And this is an open subset. So one can show that the Bretholm operator, because Bretholm property is stable in the sense that you perturb a Bretholm operator by 
a small um, norm perturbation that this is out the scope of well. Okay. So, um, okay. the index <coughs> of the threshold operator T in F of H is defined by, well, we have the condition that these two numbers are finite, so it makes sense if we just subtract them. And this kind of gift of information about the kernel and co-kernel under some assumptions. For example, if we have operators where we know for some reasons that the index is positive and the operator necessarily has a non trivial kernel, um, and it can be exploited quite nicely in many different situations. <coughs> Maybe some words about the history. Sometimes, particularly in the Russian literature, uh, threat -home operators are called neuter operators, or sometimes the index of the threat -home operator is called the neuter index of the operator. And I have often heard the question, what does she has to do with that? But it's not she, it's he. And Minuta, um, well, had three brothers, and one of her brothers was a mathematician as well, called Fritz Nöter. The father was a mathematician as well, called Max Nöter, but the brother Fritz Nöter, he worked in um, yeah, mechanics and mathematics, so that time, the um, beginning of the last century. And that's a bit, not, not a bit, it's a sad story in the end. And you know that when the uh, Nazis took over the power in Germany, when Emmy Nutter fled to the United States, and her brother Fritz, so the two other brothers had already died at that time. And um, her brother Fritz, he was in favor of communism, so he um, fled to the Soviet Union. And he became a professor for mathematics and seemed to be okay for a moment. But then there was this uh, Stalin terror in 1938-1939, if I'm not wrong. Wait a note here, 37-38, 37, 38. 37, 38. And um, at that time he got uh, arrested and was uh, um, sentenced to prison for 25 years for um, being a spy for Germany, which was wrong, it was not true, they made it up. And then um, his family escaped from Russia at that time, and they didn't know what happened to him for many decades until 1989, I think. Finally, um, they, they, uh, they got them to know that uh, he was actually, when Germany invaded uh, Russia in 1941, I think, 1942, I'm not sure, then at least he was sentenced to death and um, was shot, I think, 41, September, or 42. I have, uh, as I always struggle with the number, there's somewhere 41, 1941. Um, so that's the story of uh, Fritz Nutter. Um, yeah. So if you come across some book where they say Nutter operators or Nutter index, then it's just Fritz Nutter. Okay, so some examples. Then we come back to Luther in a moment. So the first example is the most known one. There is a whole theory about these types of operators. And these are compact perturbations of the identity. For examples. So if P is the identity on H plus K, K, for some compact operator K. So compact means that it maps bounded sets to relatively compact sets. Um, then T is threat home and the index of T. Is zero. And this is the fact that you uh, yeah, probably have heard an introduction class and functional analysis where they do this so called Reese Schauder theory. Uh, 
the powers of these operators and study the kernels and co kernels and one of the uh, outcomes of this is just that the kernel and the co kernel have the same dimension. And so you can always get here the zero. So then the question is um, I mean, I should say that Trepholm um, invented those operators because of he studied integral equations. And for integral equations, that is the common setting. So you start with a differential equation, you want to have a solution theory, so you integrate over it. And then you get something of the form identity plus compact, and uh, and this is the uh, the way how the operators kind of uh, popped up in mathematics and attracted so much interest. And um, to get um, operators with a non-trivial index, there is a kind of standard trick. So we consider little l two. This should be the space of all sequences in um, complex numbers such that uh, they are square summable. So this is less than infinity. This is the Hilbert space. If we define The scalar product just by n from one to infinity x n times y one y n and complex conjugate of that number. And here we can nicely create um Bretton operators. We just define the operator which I have called P. K sub R, and this should be the operator from L2 to L2. And what does it do? It takes PRK and apply it to a sequence, which I call here U. And this should be at least the first K um, entries of the sequence uh, at zero. And then I put here X1, X2. And so on. The so usual be the sequence Xn. So I just shift the whole sequence by k entries to the right. And then I see that this operator has no kernel. So if I equate this to zero, then all the sequence entries have to be zero. But it has a k-dimensional co-kernel. Because there are k-dimensions which I don't reach by the operator. And I can do the same with the other direction. I put PKL from L2 to L2 and PKL, PKL U should be XK plus one, XK plus two. So, so I kind of let the first K components disappear and just shift the other ones to the left. And then I see here I have the k-dimensional kernel, but I don't have a co-kernel because it's a subjective. And so in total, I see that pk right and pk left are both platform operators on H. And okay, and the index of the right shift. So here we said that this operator has the k-dimensional um, co-kernel, no kernel. So this is minus k. And the index of the p KL KL is k. H is L2. Uh, H is L2, yes. <clears throat> Okay. So, what do we learn from this example? So, we learn that um, <clears throat> yeah. So, I forgot one piece of notation. So I will do this now. So. Fk of h now for a general h will be the set of all p in f of h 
such that the index of T is K. Okay. So and then we see with this example that FK of little L2 is not empty for all K and Z. Right, so L2, we have um, program operators of any index. And this is also true on any separable Hilbert space because every separable Hilbert space is unitary equivalent to L2. I don't want to go into detail with you. If you've seen this result, then probably you believe me that it's true. And if you have not seen it, then um, just ignore it. It's not very essential, but this is my information. I should put it down. So is actually false for any I just write for any H, so we assume that H is a separable Hilbert space. It's actually is also true for non-separable Hilbert spaces, but it's wrong for Banner spaces. You can make the same definition of the random operator. So this one here, here you see the edge line, so it doesn't work directly, but this definition you can do on the Banner space, but on Banner spaces. These sets FK can be empty, but it's a nothing I want to go into detail today. So now three theories before we come to the sulfur joint case. So the first one we can take this index here as a map. And we can consider this map on phi zero of the spectrum operator, so on the connected components. So then you can show that, um, and this is true of the integers, of course. And now one can show that if you have a path of random operators, which is continuous in the long topology, then the index doesn't change along the path. And you can also show if you have two quantum operators having the same index, then you can actually find the path between them. And so this implies that this is is a bijection. So the index put to stay on by zero um, yeah, distinguished quantum operators. The second theory. If you take FK of H, then this is homotopy equivalent to F0 of H. So all these different path components of the space of Bretham operators are homotopy equivalent to each other. And these two results. I'm not, I would say, extremely um, deep. So both results can be found, can be found in, let's say, common textbooks. Um, and I'm not too hard to prove. But what is more sophisticated is the next theory. So that's really a big one. And that is, I, I hope that it's correct, but uh, I mean, the theory is correct, but I think the author's theory is this is correct that these are really the first to observe that. So, according to my knowledge, this was done by Atia and Jenich. I mean, Atia, we all know, so Jenich is uh, uh, from Regensburg, retired professor in Regensburg, 
and uh, this was the Amy's PhD thesis 1965. And I read yesterday in the internet when I Googled for the theory, it was somewhere written that Atia conjectured it in one of his papers, and Yenich proved it in his PhD thesis. That you can also compute the higher homotopy groups. Oh, F0 of H, F0 of H is homotopy equivalent to the others. So it doesn't know. Um, Loss of generality if you split to this half component. So, and this is zero if k is odd and the integers if k is even. And this is one result which is wrong in the case if you go to uh, real Hilbert spaces. So, real Hilbert spaces uh, have an uh, eight table dissipation of two tables. This is related to the box table dissipation k theory, but um so there are different groups at least two so what Tia and Jenny or what Jenny did he showed that um, F0 of H is a classifying phase of the chart for the part of the classifying space for K theory. And that means if you take all homotopies or homotopy classes of um, from compact spaces into these random operators of index zero, then this is um, bijective to actually the so called the yield k theory of x. And here is something. That I will also call I and D, but this is not the index, except when X is a point. This is in general the so called index bundle. But then you have to deal with K theory, and that's a yeah. What's pleasant for everyone, but you can also give a direct proof of that. So another way would be by fiber bundle theory. You can build nice operator spaces and then um, using long exact sequence of fiber bundle to get out this result. And this is something that you can find in the book that I announced in the beginning, but it's of course not due to us that the classical uh, old argument, but you can find it there. Um, well, okay. this then proves my book here, this thing, I guess. So you can also see it like that. Yeah. Okay, so there are many important formulas for computing this index. The most known probably the Atiyah Singer index theory. Where you have an elliptic operator on a manifold, and then you can just compute the Stratum index in terms of topological data as a so called symbol. Here, yeah, Singer index theory. Then there is a Pedosov index theory. Pedosov. Formula, I think it's called there's a so called Carolias index theory and many, many more. So, this index has attracted a lot of interest in the last decades. But there's one problem about the index
Does it mean uh, does it mean that we also have a way to when we click A for the for instance, that we can actually when we have a map from the two sphere into the space of the platform map, so we can actually uh, compute the index. So not just pi zero, but also pi two. Generalizing at here zima. So at here zima just holds for k equals zero, right? Or so I mean it, it just gives me just gives me information about the the, the path connected components of the because it, it computes me the index of the platform map. But here, as we say, uh, uh, is there any is there a way also like the generalization of of Atia Zima beyond the case of yes yes okay. there is an index theory which then holds in K theory and which computes um, this top so there's a topological index and for any family. And you have exactly the same formula. I just don't, I mean, this was a series of papers by Atia and Singer developing this index. I don't know in which of them it was the family, family case, maybe part four or part three. I don't, I don't remember. But somewhere in there. Okay, so problem. Um, many important upper records. Uh, salted down. For example, if you just think about, well, not medical physics, but if you just think about physics, and here the salted down operators have a meaning in physics, and they have a new spectrum, and what you can measure in physics are the eigenvalues of these operators, and so they are, they are salted down. What if C is in Fs of H, which is um, which I will denote, which will denote the space F of H intersected with S of H. Then the index of T this dimension of the kernel of T, and now we remember that there were two equivalent definitions in one sense. Of you can do it in this way. So this is um, the same dimension of the of the co-kernel, so no dimension of the image. But if the operator is salted joint, then t is equal to t star, and this is zero. So meaning whenever we start with a salted joint operator, we don't need to look for formula. The index has to be zero. So we can't find anything, any interesting index formula in the case of a salted joint problem. And this motivated people then, primarily Atia and Singer in the 70s, to look for something else. What is the natural replacement of the index in case of self joint operators? And this is already part three. It's the longest part. And this is the so called spectral flip. I read some additional notation. And and sort of sorry, uh, why it's a problem is that if you have positive index, for example, you know that your differential equation has solutions because you have a kernel because yeah, right yeah. or something like this, and maybe yeah. that not you simply don't know. Yes, yeah. You can't get anything out of this index because it's always zero, whatever the operator does. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so spectral flow contains the word spectral, and it comes from spectral. So we have to talk about the spectrum at first. And I will just consider here self joint operators to make our life a little bit easier. And what we could introduce the spectrum. Probably remember from, I mean, at least from linear algebra, you know that the spectrum of uh, the symmetric matrix is real, and the same is true for solver joint operators on the space. Just to prove it a bit different, but anyway, we can restrict here on lambda and r such that lambda minus t is not in GL of h. So we have the inverted operators. GL of H is open because of this, this set is closed, and one can also show by the Neumann series that this is actually bounded, and so it's compact. 
and the complement of this will be here. Um, It's called the spectrum, and this is compact. In the wheels, and the complement of this, which are the nodes in the row, is um, yeah, C minus sigma of C is called. The variable band. There's also a variable band operator, not only a variable band set, and so on. I should be a bit careful when speaking about the variable band. I usually call the set the variable band, but most people call it the operator the variable band anyway. I don't use the operator here. Okay, and now we need certain um, subsets of the spectrum. Practically three of them. Yeah. As of age, we set first sigma sub P of T. Which is the set of all lambda in lambda and R, which is lambda sigma C, such that the kernel of lambda minus P is not just zero. This is called the point spectrum. And as you see from the definition, these are just the eigenvalues of the operator. Then we have something which is called the continuous spectrum, sigma sub C, which are all lambda in sigma of T such that the kernel is trivial, but the image of lambda minus T is not close. So um, it's a self joint operator, so we can write here. It's not the whole space. <coughs> the so called essential spectrum, I mean, this is like a so called continuous spectrum. Operator. And the final one is the so called essential spectrum. These are all lambda in sigma of t such that lambda minus t is not a threat of These are the three parts, the three parts of the spectrum that I need. Yeah. And let me make as a remark. The spectrum, the whole set, consists of the point spectrum union with the continuous spectrum. And that's a disjoint union. Why is so? I mean, if I'm not invertible, with lambda minus t, okay, then I could have a kernel, but I'm certainly not invertible. But if I have no kernel, then I know from the fact that the adjoint of the kernel of lambda minus t is just the orthogonal complement of the image. I know that in this case, the, um, uh, the image has to be, can't, can't be dense, so can't be closed. And so we get this um, disjoint union of these two sets. And I can also decompose the spectrum as point spectrum 
union with the essential spectrum. So either I am an eigenvalue or I'm not a threat -up operator. That's all also all that can happen, but this is not this job. And this comes from the fact that um, you can have an eigenvalue of infinite multiplicity. So that, yeah, for example, kernel dimension kernel to eigenvalue of zero, then you don't have a threat -up operator. Okay, so what's, uh, what's the example to keep in mind, which has uh, a continuous spectrum, like which T should I choose? Um, well, you can, for example, take just the compact operator, which is solve the joint. Okay. But those operators have, may, may have a trivial kernel, but mm -hmm. zero is in the kernel. Right. So zero, zero is in the spectrum, mm -hmm. and then this is necessarily in the continuous spectrum. Right. Yeah, that may be the easiest way. Okay, and then I need a bit of space for the next big theorem. Oh, I announced a while ago that I will come back to Fredhoff to, to Noether at some point, and I forgot about this. The reason why the index is sometimes called Noether index is because Noether was the first person who had an example of a Fredhoff operator of index non zero. I mean, we had this shift operators, and they are very easy to write down, but he had a natural example of an integral equation coming from the PDE from physics. This is an article from 1920 published by Fritz Noether. It's a nice article. Okay, now we have the next theorem. And this is due to Tia and Singer. So the ones from the Tia Singer index theorem, and this was in 1969. The paper said, uh, has a title, I think, Index Theory of Steward Joint Operators, but they are also from um, results for circuit joint operators. You know? And this will be of interest for us because they consider Fs of H, so the circuit joint pattern operator, and they prove that Fs of H has three connected components. So what happens? The components are as follows. We first have F as classes of H, which are all self-adjoint threat operators. Such that the essential spectrum is a subset of the positive half line. So the essential spectrum can never contain zero because then the operator wouldn't be flat on, right? By definition of the essential spectrum. We can put the, all the essential spectrum on the right hand side. Or you have all the essential spectrum on the left hand side of the axis. <coughs> and of course, the remaining case, yeah, I did not this with an I for a definite is just F S of H minus these two other guys. So there we have essential spectrum on both sides of the axis. So zero is never in the essential spectrum, but we can have it now in the negative and in the positive part of the real life. So when they had more than this group, they actually showed that Fs plus and minus 
are contractible to plus or minus the identity of them. It's a bit like code. You just can break by straight path, put all of this to the identity or to minus the identity. So from the topological point of view, this is a drawing component. And okay, I write it in K theory because I know that Thomas likes K theory. So, uh, so I would say F S I of H is I can't say because I don't have space at the moment. Write off something. It's classified by its K to the minus one. So this means that um, we have as before here the homotopy uh, classes of maps from compact space into operator and this is a bijection to the odd k theory but this if you haven't seen that then just ignore it the important result for us is that it follows from this result that we can read of the um, homotopy groups and they are now exactly opposite to the ones of the uh, proton operators that we saw before here we have this is that the k is odd and zero if k is even. To prove this, do you write an explicit homotopy like between the loop space or something? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Actually, the theorem which is proved is something about the loop space, mm -hmm. and then this follows the consequence. Okay, so and um, yeah, one interesting thing about this is now something that Akia and Singer did later, but together with that time the young Indian mathematician. This was nineteen seventy six. They constructed an explicit isomorphism of pi one of this component to the integer integers, and this is the spectral flow. So and I will first introduce the idea of the spectral flow, and then it will be good to have a break, and then I show you the analytical definition in terms of spectra. I want to ask one more question about about this. So if you want to do this for like KO, so real K theory, okay, I'm going to look at operators, real operators, mm -hmm. um, but there are also models of the higher K groups in terms of purely in terms of operators, not as just one bit yeah. iterator loop places and so on. Yeah. Is it also in this work or is it somewhere yes, else? Yes, also in this work. Yeah. And you get the exactly bank space for K or minus seven. Yeah. Okay. So the idea starts with the following observation, which is in, if you are a bit in respect to theory, then you can do this as as a even easy exercise or whatever, one can prove it. But that's it. That's not very, not very long. It's the following lemma: If we have an operator which is self-adjoint and threshold, then either <coughs> zero is in the resonance set. So then the operator is invertible and obviously threshold. Or 
it is, and so if it's not in the vessel then set, so if it is in the spectrum, then it is an isolated eigenvalue. Of finite multiplicity. So, in a gap about zero, you only have isolated eigenvalues of finite multiplicity. So, in other words, the spectrum looks like the spectrum of a matrix. What happens away from zero, we can't really control. That could be essential spectrum and kind of ugly behavior. But close to zero, everything is, is particularly nice. And if you go back to these components, then we basically have the three following pictures. And you probably just said it, but uh, this is not an S, this is a row. It's the resultant set. Sorry? So S of T, that's the resultant set, not. Uh, that's the resultant set. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. That is uh, no, a row. Not, yeah. yeah, when I was in England, I had sometimes students from Greece and they always complained a lot about my writing. <laughs> okay, so uh, what can happen? We know that. The spectrum is a subset of the real line. So what um, now the picture here in F is plus, we know that we have essential spectrum here and Here at most some finite isolated eigenvalues. Here we have the opposite picture somewhere in some essential spectrum from the negative half line and some eigenvalues maybe here. So in particular, in this case, if you are from um, yeah, from analysis, then you might know the Morse index, which is the number of negative eigenvalues. Counted with multiplicity. So for these operators, you would have the value of the Morse index. And here in this topologically interesting component, you have essential spectrum on both sides, but a nice, still a nice gap about zero where you have isolated eigenvalues for a single object. But we are looking for an explicit isomorphism from pi one. So we need to talk about pi. So the idea of the spectral flow is now take this axis here and rotate it counterclockwise by 90 degrees. And let's say we have a path here, L, lambda and AB, path in FS of H. Can be any component, doesn't need to be the topologically interesting one. Then if we take this picture, we have here and here, The central spectrum of L0, L, L A, so we point where we start with our path. We have our eigenvalues. And now we switch on the time and we let the path go from A to B. So, what happens? What is the idea? Our essential spectrum. Will always have a gap to zero. So this is here the essential spectrum of the operator appears. 
depending on which component, which component we are, that might be on both sides of the line. And the idea is that we now take these eigenvalues and they hopefully will behave like continuous spin functions, but hopefully they do actually. And then they evolve in time. And then what we do is this, we count crossings of the eigenvalues with zero. Uh, <coughs> Okay, I'm always fighting when I work with mathematical physicists because I call my eigenvalues mu and lambda is my parameter. They don't like for them an eigenvalue is lambda. But for me, it's a parameter. Anyway, so, um, so we have here these two functions of eigenvalues depending on the parameter lambda. We let the parameters reverse the interval from A to B. And now we count crossing of these eigenvalue functions with the axis. And whenever an eigenvalue goes from the negative to the positive side, we add plus one or um, more precisely plus the dimension of the eigenspace to the multiplicity. And whenever something goes from positive to negative, we add minus one. And then we add up all these contributions. And this is then the idea of the spectral flow. Of course, this can't work in this way because it's at least as complicated as counting the, uh, the zeros of a continuous function, which is not possible because they can't have uh, um, the cardinality of the continuum. But of course, there are methods like Brouwer degree or whatever you stabilize, and then uh, you can still make sense of this. And um, this is basically, yeah, done in the exact definition of the spectral flow. But my first hour is up at this moment, and that's perfect because um, after the break, I will just show you the exact definition of the spectral flow in, in a rigorous way, which was done by Phillips in 1996 in terms of function analysis. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so um, as announced before the break, I will now um, show you the um, rigorous analytic construction of this um, this invariant spectral flow, and this goes back to Phillips. Um, this is. Uh, John Phillips, the paper on uh, on nineteen ninety six. Um, yeah, I mean this should not mean that the construction by Atia, Puri, and Singer was not rigorous, but it, it, they wrote a bit like okay, you approximate, you, you can assume that they are smooth, and then you just approximate and use the um, intersection number with the lines, concepts from differential topology. And Philip pointed out that all this can be done. Um, Purely in terms of functional analysis. And those of you that uh, are very well aware of the paper of Fleur, then you might argue that some paper, or at least in one paper of Fleur, you had similar ideas before already in 1988, where he constructed something similar, but um, he just yeah, made a construction in the same way, but he didn't prove the uh, properties of it. And we will come to this in a moment. Anyway, so how does it look? Let's say we have. A solid joint plasma operator. And we have two real numbers, A less than B, such that the interval AB does not contain any point of the essential spectrum. So we have resolvent or just um, point spectrum. <laughs> And in this situation, I set a notation E of EAB shall be defined as the direct sum over L mu and AB such that the kernel of uh, sorry, over the kernel of mu times identity minus the operator T. So I just um, sum up over all eigenvalues in this interval AB. 
so the eigenspaces of all eigenvalues in this interval. And then one can show the following level about stability of spectra. So if P is a sort of joint breton operator, and A less than B, such that A and B are in the resolvent set of P, and as above, we have that the interval does not contain any essential spectrum. So then there is epsilon greater than zero, such that A, B is in the relevant set of S and the Dimension of E at with respect to this interval AB is the dimension of e, PAB. So we have the same number of eigenvalues including multiplicity for all S surface joint breton of the page um, norm S minus P. Is less than epsilon. So I have two points in the relevant set, and if I can chirp the operator by a small perturbation, then these points are still in the relevant set, and the number of eigenvalues, including multiplicity, in this interval doesn't change. That's a statement about spectral stability. So now we want to apply this to our situation there. So if I rewrite it for my part, then I get the following result. So if L, L lambda, lambda in AB is the part in FS of H, then there is a partition A, which should be lambda north less than number one, and so on, until some lambda capital N, which is B, and numbers of okay, AI greater than zero, um, maybe not best notation, because there's an A here, but it's fine. I from one to N, such that plus minus AI is not in or yeah is in the resolvent set of L lambda and the dimension of E L lambda minus AI AI is finite and constant. For lambda in the interval from i minus one to i and i from one to n. That sentence is horrible and it's always painful to write it as a word because it's very long and it feels like it contains a million of information, uh, different information. But what you do is far easier to understand in the picture. So we have the spectral stability. Now we just apply it to the path point wise and we use compactness of the path so we can cover I mean, a finite with many numbers having this property that is not in the picture as follows. Uh, there is red color. I start here. With a one and minus a one. They are in the relevant set of the operator. Right? Because these are eigenvalues here, and here I have the essential spectrum. But if I go here and here, I have two elements in the relevant set. Then I go along my path, I stay in the relevant set. 
up to a certain point, maybe here, and here I stop. And then I do it locally again. Here I stop because otherwise I would cross spectrum. And then maybe, I don't know, here, so here. So this would be, uh, this is A1, so this would be A2, A3, A4. This would be here, lambda naught is A, and I have here lambda one, here lambda two, here would be my, Lambda three and lambda four would be B. So I just put in the picture these kind of boxes. So in these horizontal lines in the boxes, they never cross the spectrum. The vertical ones can, that's not a problem, but the horizontal ones, they don't cross the spectrum. And now the definition of Phillips construction of the spectral flow is a nice formula just in terms of the dimensions of these spaces. Uh, the spectral flow of our part L is defined by spectral flow of L is the sum i from one to capital n let me write down the formula and explain what, what actually is happening here we take the dimension of e of l lambda i and then from zero to a i minus the dimension by l lambda i minus one from zero to a i and I sum this up from one to n. So that means I go from box to box, and in every box, I check how many eigenvalues cross this line minus how many eigenvalues cross this line from zero to AI. And then I do it in this box, in this box, and in that box. So if we do it for this first box, so where I would be one. So I have here one minus one. In this box, there's no eigenvalue crossing, um, sorry, not the horizontal, the vertical lines. Right? How many eigenvalues cross the vertical lines here? So here I have one minus one. Here I have zero minus zero. Here I have one minus zero because no eigenvalue crosses this part of the box. And here again, nothing is crossing the vertical lines of this box. So this is zero to zero, zero minus zero. And so I add all these contributions up, and here I would get zero plus zero plus one plus zero. So the spectral flow of L is one as an interpretation. You have one point where an eigenvalue crosses the axis from negative to positive. But this is completely real. The stability result is functional analysis, stability of eigenvalues. Of operators. Okay, and the surprising thing about all this, I mean, to me, this was the most surprising thing. This is well defined. So you really can show that this formula does not depend on the partition and on the choice of the numbers AI. And also, this is just rather basic functional analysis, and it's wonderfully written down in Philip's paper. It's a short paper, six pages, I think, or maybe eight, I don't know. But um, because the, the, the construction of the spectral flow is just the first part of this paper, and it's really nicely done. So this is really fine, and it has the following property. So 
good. If a lambda is okay, class of thought and transcriptive operators, but all these operators are invertible. If they are always invertible, then no eigenvalue crosses the axis. So this would be a point where they are not invertible. So if no eigenvalue crosses the axis, then the spectral flow of L is zero. And so we have a kind of existence property. If the spectral flow is non zero, then we have an operator on our path which has a non trivial term. Right? Like we could have done with the index in the David Monster that I offer. Second, if L1, L2 are two paths in the Salter John Breton operator, such that, yeah, I mean, I mean, the topologists who perfectly understand what I mean, I know some that L2A. Will be L1B. So this should not mean that the end point of L1 is the initial point of L2. So I can compose these paths, Con concatenate them. So then the spectral flow of L2 concatenated with L1 is the spectral flow of L2 plus the spectral flow of L1. And the nicest proof in Philip's paper is a proof of the following property. If any from zero one times A B to F S of A is a homotopy, so a homotopy, and we want the endpoints to be fixed, such that H of T A. And H of EB are constant. For T in our interval, then the spectral flow of H zero, so the initial path in the homotopy is the same than the spectral flow of H one. So the end, the final part of the homotopy. And there are other versions of, uh, of homotopy invariants. Keeping the endpoints fixed is just one version. You can also keep them invertible, for example. This also doesn't change the flow, but then they're allowed to loop. Um, but I don't want to go into details. The important observation is by two and three, you get that. <coughs> This is a homomorphism. All right. And I can put here the I because otherwise the spaces are contractible and then it would be just zero. <laughs> okay, and one more property which you don't find in any of the papers related to this construction because the global analysts like Matthias, Adobe, Phillips are not really interested in this property. This is what happens with this formula here if you go to Fs plus or Fs minus. So if L lambda is in Fs plus of H. Or lambda in A B, then the spectral flow of L is the Morse index of L H minus the Morse index of L B. So the number of negative eigenvalues comes with multiplicity. And this also makes perfectly sense to put in the I here. Because then the spectral flow only depends on the endpoints. So if you consider it for a closed path, it necessarily has to be zero when it's also a multiple invariant. Okay, but I mean, we started with the question 
to find an explicit isomorphism from pi one to the integer. So maybe one will not here. This path doesn't need to be closed, right? This can be any open path that doesn't need to be closed. But in the special case that we have a closed path, we have here a homomorphism, and I promise that this will be an isomorphism. And so what do we need to, to show? We know already that this group here is infinitely cyclic. So if we now know that this is, I mean, we know that's a homomorphism, this is infinitely cyclic, these are the integers. So we now only need to show to show a sort of, sort of, sort of, only need to show subjectivity. Then it is an isomorphism. It makes our life very easy. So we only have to construct on an arbitrary separable Hilbert space. Um, a loop having spectral flow equal to one. So to show that the spectral flow of pi one FSI of H in that is an isomorphism. We only need to find close path having spectral flow equal to one. Okay, this we can done. Uh, yeah, this can be done quite explicitly. Actually, in the unbounded case, in the moment we will go to unbounded operators, it's far easier than in the bounded case. But uh, yeah, I will. So we are in the bounded case first. I mean, the construction is not difficult, but it's not very explicit. So, um, Exploiting a duplicate blackboard. Seen worse. Sorry? It has seen worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what can we do? So that E N N and Z be complete. Autonomous system of H, which exists because we have a separable Hilbert space. So we know that every autonomous basis is countable. And now set P plus, let P plus be the projection onto. The span of E n and an end closure. Right. And from one to infinity U E n E n E minus. I mean, I should write the problem to get right. On to Span of E minus N and an N at P zero, the orthogonal projection onto the span of E zero. And then we just define L. Lambda from minus one to one side by L lambda is P plus minus P minus plus lambda is zero. So that's certainly a continuous path into the non topology. And if you consider the spectrum, now our parameter goes from minus one to one, then we have. One as an eigenvalue of infinite multiplicity, so it's the essential spectrum. 
for all lambdas. We have minus one as an eigenvalue of infinite multiplicity. So this is in the essential spectrum. <coughs> And then we have E naught uh, as, an, um, as an eigenvector of multiplicity one. And this goes from minus one to plus one. So now we don't really need to build boxes here. I think we all agree that here we have that the spectral flow of L. Equal to one. Now, this part is not close, but we can easily close it to a loop by the following fact. So, if we take the self adjoint Breton operators indefinite and if we intersect them with GL of A, then this is part connected. When I was a student, I found it very annoying that this was just written in a lot of papers without any comments, as if it would be a triviality. And uh, nowadays, I perfectly agree that it's true. Um, <laughs> it's not really difficult. You make a polar, polar decomposition of the operators, and then you just squeeze one part of the identity, and then you just need that um, the standard result about orthogonal projections. I hope you believe me for the moment. I better. Want to use my time to go to the unbounded setting, and if you want to see the proof, then we can discuss it after the talk. Right. But if you use this fact, then we can close this part to the to loop. So, because this part has at minus one and at plus one, zero is not in the spectrum, so that is invertible. So thus, we can close L to a loop. And by a path that's called L twiddle. And the spectral flow of concatenates L twiddle and L is now the spectral flow of L twiddle plus the spectral flow of L by the second property, which I uh, have. Wiped off, unfortunately. And by the first property, we know that as these operators are all invertible, this closure to a loop, this spectral flow is zero. And so we get that in total, no, I'm passing off the board. Spectral flow of our original path L, and this was one. And so we get a closed path of spectral flow one, and thus have indeed an isomorphism. Okay, perfect. Now we have half an hour to talk about unbounded operators, spaces of unbounded operators. Okay, here's the setting is a little bit different. So we start with operators C, which are now defined on a certain domain in our Hilbert space H and they are mapped to H. B of T could be a dense linear subspace. For example, H could be L2, and the domain could be a subordinate space. It could be a typical setting where this appears. Um, and usually, these operators are not bounded. Um, and this is actually the case we are interested. So now forget about boundedness and this norm which we have for bounded operators. But so if it's not bounded, so we know that boundedness 
is equivalent to continuous. So we are now dealing with non-continuous operators. So that, of course, can be something really <laughs> something crazy. But we can um, make an important de definition that kind of is, I mean, the following definition is the so-called, I would say, the boundedness of the unbounded operator. Um, this is as follows. We say that an operator is closed if the graph of the operator, which is just the normal definition of the graph, this is now an H times H, such that U is in the domain of T if this is a closed subspace in H times H. So I built the graph of the operator, just all pairs U, T, U, where the operator is defined. So this here should be a D for domain. And this is a subspace in H times H, and I call the operator closed if this is a closed subspace. This makes sense for any operator. Doesn't need to be bounded or whatever. So then I make the following notation C of H should be the set of all T defined on some domain U of T such that T is closed. And there's one important thing to note here. As these operators are not bounded, we don't have the operator norm anymore. So we don't have um, the metric at this moment. Here. And actually, this closeness assumption is very different, very different from the boundedness assumption in the sense that you cannot add operators and there's a many different ways. If you add two operators, they are not necessarily closed anymore if the operators are closed. And so that's a, a more difficult setting. But there's still an adjoint of operators. Not going to introduce it formally, it would take the least of limitation theory, but um, don't worry about that. Uh, the adjoint T star of T from T of T in H to H, this operator T doesn't need to be close to have an adjoint, but it needs to be densely defined. This is a minimal requirement, but we said in the beginning, T of T is always a dense subspace. It is determined by T U V is U T star V, but now there's one thing we need to be careful. U is in the domain of T, and V is in the domain of T star, where the domain of T star is given by all V and H such that the map U V goes to T U V is bounded on the domain of T. So that's a relatively abstract definition, but this you need to build this operator T star in the unbounded set. Okay. Um, there are lots of things that can happen. For example, if you start with a densely defined operator and you build the adjoint, it can happen that the domain of the adjoint just consists of zero. So it can really kill everything. But it's better if the operators are closed, then they behave a bit better. So we have the following lemma. First part, um, the adjoint of an operator is always closed. And second part, if we start with the closed operator, what we will do in um, the rest of the talk, then the adjoint is densely defined. And if it's densely defined, then we can build the adjoint of the adjoint. And then we get here again the operator, um, which is now more difficult. Okay, before we come to Fredman operators, I have one more definition in this setting. Also, a point that often causes some confusion, P is called 
symmetric if P is contained in P star, that means that the domain of T is a subset of the domain of P star and P U is P star U for all U in the domain of T. And T is called sulfur joint. If P star is equal to T, which in particular includes that the domain of T is equal to the domain of P star. And this, this is often difficult to check for concrete operators. There's a nice example in Rodin's book on functional analysis where he takes and just the operator building u to i times u prime, making u to i times u prime on the sort from the solar space to l2. And then he just changes the boundary conditions a little bit. And for one of the boundary conditions, the operator is uh, nothing. For one, it's symmetric. And for the third one, it's in self joint. So in small changes, you can destroy a lot of things in this setting. So now let's come to Breton operators. How can they be defined in this unbound setting? Okay. Yeah. Now you remember when I introduced the spread of operators in the bounded case, I said the first assumption is that the operator is bounded. We said the bounded operator is called spread of if dimensional kernel and dimensional co kernel are finite. And here we now take instead of boundedness, closeness. So a close operator on A is called. Right on. If and then the same like in the bounded world, the dimension of the kernel of P is finite, and uh, the co-dimension of the image of T is finite, and we could do the same definition as in the bounded case with the adjoints. It would also work, but let's keep it like this. Okay, and now we come back to the spectral flow. And I now introduce the set, which I denote by CF and up as A of H. And this should be the set of all closed operators of H such that P is self adjoint and He is Bretton. So what is now the problematic thing here? In the bounded case, the sulfur joint Bretton operators or the Bretton operators were a subset of the bounded operators. In the bounded operators, we have the norm. So this norm restricts to a metric. So we have a metric and everything is fine. Here we a priori don't have anything. So we cannot even add two operators and they are still in the set or multiply or whatever. It's all and it's not that clear how to build the concrete metric. But there are two approaches, or at least two approaches, two natural metrics on this side. <clears throat> the first one is via the so called Ries transform. Or some people call it also the bounded transform of an operator. So there is an injective map F from the closed sulfur joint button operator to the sulfur joint button operator of H. And this is as follows. I take the operator and I build T find identity 
plus p squared to the minus one half. So what does this mean? So there are two ways to think about this. You can look in old books of Ries, and then you find an explicit construction how explicit proves what this operator does. So you can square your operator, this affects your domain, it's getting smaller in general. You put the identity, then you can show that this operator um, is, by, is bijected from its domain to the Hilbert space. Then you can build an inverse. Then you have a sulfur joint bounded operator. And for sulfur joint bounded operators that are positive, so they have no points in the negative spectrum, you can always take a square root. That's something that you learn in functional analysis. And then you multiply this operator by t. But what you also learn in functional analysis, maybe, and this is one of the coolest parts of functional analysis, and you can take any measurable, but let's say here, continuous function, and you can plug an operator into it. This is a functional calculus. And this is also how, how this can be seen. So you can check that this operator now is self adjoint, it is fragile, and it is bound. So now we can build a metric because it's injective. We just define the least distance between two self adjoint fragile operators as f of t minus f of s. And then we put here. L of H to indicate that this is the operator normally bound up. And this gives us a map on this space. There's a second way how to do it. And this comes from that definition. We assume <laughs> our graphs are closed. And we just for perfect joint operators automatic that they are closed. But anyway, so we have that the graphs are closed subspaces. On closed subspaces in Hilbert space, we always have an orthogonal projection. So that's also something that we can perfectly use. So second method. So the self adjoint operators are contained in closed operators for every C in closed. On certain joint, there is the orthogonal projection that's called a T sub T onto the graph of T in. Now, as a projection on h times h, right? The graph lives in h times h, and we know that it's a closed subspace, so we have an orthogonal projection onto the graph. So we can define the so called graph or gap distance of PGTS as PT minus PS, and now in L h times h. So we take the projection onto the graphs, take the difference, and build the operator norm, but now on h times h. This is also kind of a natural idea. So now let's talk about the spectral flow. So historically, people took this first option. Actually, when Atia and Singer started studying the spectral flow, they were not interested in bounded operators. They considered elliptic operators, elliptic differential operators, and many that are only unbounded. But they implicitly always said, okay, we can always make them bounded by this transform. But if you think about this rigorously, then you have to introduce this as a metric and first have to check that your operators are continuous. And, um, and that's well. Can be done, and that's essentially a sensible approach because by the so called spectral mapping theorem of functional analysis. So I said that you can plug the self adjoint operator in measurable functions, or let's say in continuous functions, and then the spectrum behaves quite well, at least if the function is continuous, and the spectral mapping theorem, the spectrum of this transformed operator is the transform of the spectrum 
closed. So now let's draw a picture of that map. That map. So f of t would be in this picture t by the square root of one plus t squared. T is minus one. So with this function, you transform the spectra of the unbounded operators to the bounded operators. So if you think of the spectral flow as crossing the axis, it makes perfectly sense to plug the operator and this function, and this is the behavior of the spectrum. Because whenever the unbounded operator crosses the axis from plus to minus, the same is happening after the transform. Right? So that's very sensible. And so here's the following definition. If A, for some reasons, I denote a part of unbounded operators by A and bounded ones by L. I don't know how this happened over the years, but I can't change it anymore. So if A is a part in the sulfur joint Bretton operators, that is continuous. With respect to the Ries matrix, and this means by the very definition of the Ries matrix that the transform class is continuous in F of S. And so we can define the spectral flow of A as the spectral flow of the Ries transform composed with A. So we just made it bounded by the least transform, and then we compute the spectral flow as before by Phillips formula. <coughs> so that's a natural idea. And then, of course, people were interested in the topology of the open space. So what is known about the topology? There is a theorem. I think the statement first time was written by Livio Nicolaescu of Notre Dame. Nicolaescu. It's a paper, I think, from 2000. And you also find a proof of this in the paper by Lesch from 2005, with Matthias Lesch from the University of Bonn. And so they show that the natural inclusion J, so you take the bounded operator and just consider it in the space of unbounded operators. So this space is contained in this one. I mean, same unbounded operators, but every bounded operator is unbounded in that sense. So the definition is a bit strange, but uh, that's the generalization of bounded operators. So this natural inclusion is a homotopy equivalence. And that we see that the self adjoint operators of Perpetual operators with the Ries metric has three connected components. As as of H, two of them constructible, and one of them has an interesting topology. So that there's one problem with all that. Checking continuity in this Ries metric is often difficult. Actually, it was in that paper by Nicola Escu, where he pointed that out, but he proved also a criterion with which you can show Ries continuity, which is quite convenient. But um, yeah, he pointed out that in general, it would be very difficult to show. 
and there's one theory. I can't find any reference for that, but everybody writes in the paper that it's due to this Danish mathematician, which I would pronounce Kuglede, but I know that it's wrong. He once had a Danish guest and he told me that it's wrong. Um, so I don't know a year, they don't know a reference, but everyone could his name. He gave an explicit example and um, showed that the topology induced by the least metric is strictly stronger. Than the topology induced by the gap method or the graph method. And that means that more paths with respect to the second metric here are continuous. It's easier for a path to be continuous in this metric than in the other one, right? Because this metric has less open sets. Okay. And then there is. Now let's come to metric number two. Can I show you first my theory, which is still very fascinating to me, even though I know it already for more than 20 years. So this is due to Bernhard Bos Barnbeck, the German mathematician, but he, uh, he was originally Bernhard Bos and then he moved to Denmark and was like Bos Barnbeck. Um, Matthias Lesch, the one who appears here from Bonn. So, Bos Barnbeck is a retired professor now in Roskilde. And John Phillips, the one from the well, spectral flow in the bounded case. And they have proved the fascinating result that if we take this space and we take this graph distance, the one here, then this is path connected. Why is this result so fascinating? Think of the picture with the spectrum. You have here zero. We have for many of those operators essential spectrum on both sides of the interval. You cannot go with the essential spectrum through zero because this, this would mean that you leave the Fretton operators by definition of the essential spectrum. So if you go with this path to the identity, you have to take this negative spectrum. You go to minus infinity and it comes back from the other side. And that is really surprising. Then people got more and more interested in the space. And then there is, I mean, actually, it's a funny story because both Barnbeck and Lesh and Phillips, they write in their paper uh, from 2005 that they don't know what is the fundamental root of this. Uh, of the space with the graph method. <laughs> and they said they don't know how to prove it, uh, if this is infinitely simply or not. But actually, at the same time, and published two years before the paper in which they answered, in which they asked the question, the question was already answered by uh, another guy. That is the result. Uh, Michael Joachim from Münster. It is a paper in the conference proceeding from 2003. And this is heavy abstract K theory. I don't understand this paper at all. And uh, um, but we tried it and uh, yeah, we failed. But anyway, he has, I mean, it's about KK theory of operator algebra. It's very complicated. And in the end, it somehow ends with oh, yeah, if we put for the operator algebra the complex numbers, we get the result we're looking for. So, in this, uh, so that's, yeah, um, I gave up on that. But anyway, so he proved that it's also about classifying spaces of K-theory. And as a corollary, so to say, we get that now this fold space, we know that it's connected as a property that the fundamental group is that if K is odd and zero, if K is even, which is for the Reese topology, it's uh, only true for this non-trivial component. Remember, there are three components there. And now recently, when we studied this paper by Joachim, because we wanted to include this result in our book, then we already were about to give up, I would say, but then we found on archive a nice paper by 
Marina Bokorova disappeared in archive in 1921, and she proved that, I mean, she helped this, her paper helped us to understand um, what we didn't have before in Uranium's work or how to bypass these points. Um, with this argument, you can show that if you take the graph topology here, then this is homotopy equivalent to F S I of H, so the non trivial component of the self joint. Okay. And with this result, I want to stop. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, some applause also from the people.